Hey, Veronica. Hello. So guess what? Guess what today is? Guess what this moment is? Um, the last episode of the season. It is. I can't believe we made it this far. I know. <laughs> How did we manage to do this? I don't know. Hey, everybody who's listening, this is, yeah, this is our season finale. Yeah. Of Thickest Thieves, our art heist podcast. We are, as some of you may know, maybe this is your first time listening and you're like working your way backwards from the end. That's cool too. A lot of people do that. So this, it's going to sound, we're going to sound so, oh, I don't know if we're going to sound different than we did from the first episode, but Mm -hmm. maybe a little bit. I think so. I don't know. We're more in the groove. Right. Well, if you don't know who we are, we are two private investigators and we have art backgrounds. We've worked in museums and as art writers and in galleries and done curatorial stuff. And this is where we talk about the intersection of art and crime. Yep. Because in our day jobs, we deal with the criminal justice system. Yes, we do. Here in Nashville. Yep. But I'm moving to New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be doing this between New Orleans and Nashville. So by the time this episode comes out, Veronica will be very settled, hopefully, in New Orleans. Hope so. But as of this recording, this is like her last day or two in town. So yeah. all of you can imagine that I'm like, really trying to deal with this. <laughs> At least you're driving there with me. Yeah, so I'm going to drive down to New Orleans. I've never been there. It's going to be super Which fun. blows my mind that yeah. you haven't been there. So we're going to drive down to New Orleans, unpack all your stuff, put it inside your house, and... Go to an art museum. Try not to steal anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be great. Mm-hmm. And then we'll figure out how we're going to be... Maybe we're going to be doing some remote podcasts from, <laughs> from New Orleans later yeah, on. Yeah, I'm going to look for like the kind of... A recording studio that's very similar to this one, which is, by the way, we own this town, a podcast network run by and Michael it's Eads. The who, best little studio ever. It's become a nice little home. Yeah, base. I love it here. Yeah. And it's actually, we do it in a place I used to live in. I yeah. used to live <laughs> it actually in this, used to be your home <laughs> in this place that we're recording this podcast in. So, yeah. So, speaking of art heists that we're not going to do, I want to talk a little bit about some art news. Yeah. Something that I read. And the reason why. <laughs> The reason why I like this story so much is because it's kind of an art heist that I feel like I would do. Oh, great. <laughs> like, if it, like I could have done this. I feel... I didn't... For everyone who's out, this happened in um, Vancouver, so Ooh. I didn't go there recently. But if I was going to take something, I feel like it would be something like this. Okay, now I really so, want to know. <laughs> so there was a... This happened on June 25th. So this is a like week, a couple weeks ago or something. Yesterday, okay. essentially. Yeah, essentially yesterday. So there is a bronze sculpture called Space Venus by Dolly. Oh. It's a public sculpture in Vancouver. And this, I'll pull up a picture of it, but the sculpture is a, it's, it's of a torso of a woman. And then there are, like, in front of the sculpture, there is, there are these two bugs. And what? Like, two golden bugs. Okay. And a golden egg. Like, it's, it's just this beautiful little golden it? egg, and somebody for that weekend stole the golden egg Ooh. off of this sculpture. Is it easy to just pluck off of this? She said it's really heavy and no, that it's not. So I listened to some um, radio news stories about it, and, you know, they said that, no, it's not easy to take off. But when you look at a photograph of this statue, that golden egg is just something like I see it and I'm like, I want that thing. Wow. Okay. First of all, this is an awesome sculpture. Second, yeah. how big is the egg? Like, how big is this statue? She said it was like 14 to 16 inches tall, I think. The egg? The egg oh, the itself. egg. So okay. it's pretty big. I mean, it's not like a tiny little egg. It's a sizable egg. You can carry it, but I think it's I think it's pretty big. Right. But it's just like glowing and <laughs> really amazing. And so they are interviewing the director of the museum. I can't remember. She's curator, director or something. And she, you know, they're asking her how much this egg is worth. And she does it. She explains. She's like, it's not worth anything. <laughs> Like, you cannot sell this egg. This egg doesn't, like, there's no value to it. Like, please just give it back. She's just pleading with whoever took this egg of, like, will you please give us our golden egg back? It belongs on this statue. And, you know, we really, you can't do anything with it. You can't sell it. Just give us our egg back. Wow. Okay. Also, the statue has, like, the best statue boobs I've ever seen. (laughs) It has a great rack. (laughs) Yep. It really does. (laughs) 
that's amazing. So yeah. you would have you would have done something like I that. I feel like yeah. I mean, it's such, it's such a useless thing, but I could imagine myself like getting so obsessed with this egg, and if I found out that I could like detach it, having maybe a hard time like not, not going for it and just being like, you know what? Who's gonna miss it? But that's not. Everyone misses it, and it's really bad. Whoever took the egg, give the egg back. But I get it. Also, everyone who has eggs, <laughs> who has, like, sculptures of eggs, watch out if Sarah's around, because <laughs> that's clearly her weakness here. Specifically if it's gold. I don't know. There's something about, like, a golden egg. Who doesn't want that? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, okay, so that happened at the Chali Rosso Art Gallery in Vancouver, mm. by the way. So just look it up. Look at the egg. Look how great it looks. <laughs> it's really lovely. Oh my God. <laughs> just when I thought I knew everything about you. <laughs> well, all I'm just like, you know, I'm going to keep up with this story. I'm hoping that it returns. The return of the Dolly golden egg. <laughs> yeah. Let's keep up with this egg. Yeah. That's the news that I found interesting. So. I have no art news. Okay. But I do have a story. Tell it. That's about us. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a feeling it's going to be about me and something no, weird I did. It's about both of us. <laughs> okay. And the ridiculous thing that happened a couple of weeks ago, Sarah and I recorded an episode about Chagall. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, I guess we have to confess this. We do. <laughs> and we talked about Chagall for a while. A and then long we went time. Straight to this like pub trivia in Nashville. Just Sarah and I doing some trivia and yep. we're not getting a lot of the questions but um towards Cause the we end don't, cuz a lot of the questions are sports questions yeah which are very annoying and i don't know anything about sports so we're not doing too great at this trivia night no then we all get this question about the questions like what russian artist auctioned a work for 1.5 million dollars and we looked at each other and we were like no way is it chagall no the question was oh, what was it? what russian artist has sold over like 16 paintings for over a million dollars right or something like that at auction at auction and i think we both looked at each other and we were like we can't like this is too good to be there's no way it's chagall because we just we literally just walked away from the studio after having a like two hour long <laughs> discussion Where, about we said chagall. the word the word chagall and the we name like, chagall no, no. like so many times yeah and so we put down and we also talked about the worth of Chagall. We, <laughs> we really did. did. We talked about like his paintings at auction. So yeah. we really we we decided there's no way it's Chagall. That would just be so strange. So we put Kandinsky down. Turned um, it in. Turned feeling it in. pretty confident. And then it was announced, and it was Chagall. And I just like yelled so loud, like, <laughs> "What the fuck?" <laughs> and <laughs> everyone looks at us. <laughs> they could not figure out why we are so, so sad about yeah. <laughs> this answer. But it was just like, it was a moment that could have been so amazing. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, it was a moment where we really could have, like, bet all our points. We would have known it. We just did this. It could have been this story where it was like, how coincidental. This is amazing. Like, we totally know this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it ended up, we were just devastated. <laughs> yeah. And I'll never forget it. I'll never forget the disappointment in myself. Mm -hmm. Same. So, not a great moment, but I mean, next time, next time we go to trivia and we have to trust we have our to go gut. With our gut. That's the thing. We, we knew it. Always at learn. first we said, I mean, one of us said Chagall at first and we were just like, no, no, no. We discounted it immediately because that was just too good to be true. It, yeah. We lost that game. By really, the way. really horribly. <laughs> it was kind of humiliating and we never went back. Yeah. But it is a good pub trivia situation. It's the best one in Nashville, I think. Although I, think I don't sure. want to even say what it is because then Why? because it gets so crowded. And if how many people do you think are listening to this podcast? Like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll just give a shout out to the best trivia situation in Nashville, and which it's is Twelve South. Twelve South Tap Room. Yeah, on Wednesdays. Wednesdays. It's on Wednesdays. And the reason why it's good is because it's not one of those chain. Like, one of those, like... Yeah, there's all these trivia chains. Yeah. Like, and, trivia party or something. Yeah, yeah, but this is just this guy, Nate, who's very funny. Cute. And cute. <laughs> <laughs> and he just makes up these questions, like, the day of or the day before. And so they're generally, like... They're just not super obscure. I mean, some of them are, but they're good questions, and he's very funny. And you can kind of haggle with him. Mm-hmm. On some answers. Haggle. <laughs> Do some trivia haggling. You're a pro at trivia haggling. <laughs> By the way. I don't know what that says about me. I think that puts me in the same category as like sleazy lawyers or something. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I just think sometimes we have it right, but it's like just a little bit off or they have it a little bit wrong. Yeah, I, I will go up and make a case. 
Yeah. And I'll like, I have like a strategy that I come up with and it usually works. Actually, mm-hmm. I don't think there's only been one time where it didn't work. Yeah. I don't remember what it, it was. It almost though. always works. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. I'll be proud of this weird skill. <laughs> and if any of you guys are just hanging out in Nashville and after Veronica moves to New Orleans and you want to go play 12 South Trivia with me. <laughs> Also, I need if a trivia, you're buddy. in New Orleans and you're listening to this, I'm moving uh-huh. to that city. I used to live there, but I'm moving back to continue investigation work. And I don't have any trivia friends or really any <laughs> friends there at all. So <laughs> just write me an email or something. <laughs> Get in touch. Yeah. <laughs> We're like begging for friends I now. Know. <laughs> <laughs> thick as thieves where we look for more thieves to be thick with. <laughs> yeah. We've now gone thin. We need a little more. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, well, do we want to do we want to talk about this last heist? Oh yeah. No, let's just not even bother with the heist. Fuck it. You know what? We've done <laughs> enough already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's just make this episode about us. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's hear about the heist. Okay. So this week's heist happened in Manchester, England Mm. in April of 2003. In April 2003, I was graduating high school. That's where I was. I'm a little older than Sarah, but I graduated high school in 2001. Yeah, this was like the month before I was graduating. So this is at a place called the Whitworth Art Gallery. Mm. (laughs) Why did I make that sound? (laughs) Three paintings were taken over a weekend at this gallery. This is a university gallery, so it's Manchester University that runs this art gallery. And they close on a Saturday, or maybe that Friday. They're closed over the weekend. And the art heist happened sometime. They don't know the exact time. There's no footage. But they know that it's sometime after 9 p.m. on a Saturday. Mm. And the works that are stolen in this heist are Van Gogh's The Fortification of Paris. Which I really like that piece. It's very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. I pulled up like a high res photo of it. It's gorgeous. Wow. There's some really good art websites that have very, very high res photographs of artwork. What was this one? I can't remember the actual site it was on. I should probably know that. But you can dig around and find these photos so that it's not just like a little thumbnail th- yeah situation and that was painted in 1878 mm-hmm. and somewhere said that he was 25 years old when he painted that i didn't do the math to check that out but yeah well he he was so prolific i know and it's just so funny to think of like some of these artists like being 24 and 25 years it to me it just seems so young and they were like doing all this amazing great yeah or work. like the poet rambo was like died at the age of 20 or something yeah and, you know yeah yeah It's just, I really wasted my 20s, I guess, is what, is really what what this is all coming from. Okay, so the second painting was Pablo Picasso's Poverty, which is from his blue period. We talked about his blue period a little Mm -hmm. bit on a previous episode. He's gotten so much attention, so we're not going to give him any Yeah, we're not going to give him any attention. If you want to listen to us talk about Picasso, go to the Suzanne Block episode. Yeah, there's a lot of Picasso there. Yeah. And and in other episodes, too. Yeah. But I'm going to look it up anyway. So Pablo Picasso's Poverty was painted in 1903. In Barcelona. Also, he was 24 when that was painted. And it's a it's an interesting painting. So it's like a family. I mean, it's very sad. To me, it looks like a family trudging along Whoa. in a desert. It's like a man, a woman. Is it Jesus? <laughs> I don't think this is Jesus okay. this time. <laughs> it's a man and a woman and their kids. And they're just, it's a very, it looks like they're on an arduous journey to nowhere, frankly. This is so weird. Mm-hmm. The kid looks like a, a scary little goblin. <laughs> don't they all? They kind of look like skeletons. Yeah, they look like they have been starving. Poverty. Right. Yeah. Like they're they're starving. They don't have a home and they're, you know, going through the desert or something. I don't know. And then the third painting that gets stolen is Paul Gauguin's Tahitian landscape. That Mm. that was painted in 1891 or 92 or 93. One of those. (laughs) Well, you know, sometimes when the when the title blocks say like 1891 to 93, I'm like, does that mean that he painted it, he kept working on it over those years? Or is that just it was painted sometime in between? I guess it's, it can mean all of those things. But right. There's not a day. That one's an interesting painting, too. It's very abstract. It's like a very there's no Tahitian women in it. Or anything. Right. I'm noticing that there. I don't know about the very abstract part. Yeah, I guess it's not very abstract because I can see that it's, those yeah, it's mountains trees. and then there are it's not abstract at all. <laughs> <laughs> now that I'm like zooming in on it. No, there's little huts and things. And you can see there's like a fox or a wolf or some kind of... What is this creature? What? It has like a long tail. 
No, I have a different one. Oh. This was in the report. Okay, never mind. That one is more to abstract. (laughs) (laughs) We're looking at two different paintings right now. Maybe he named several paintings. Oh, he probably did. Landscape. Yeah. Those were the three paintings. So Van Gogh, Picasso, and Gauguin. Very huge artists that were stolen. And these were all watercolors. So not as hard to steal, sort of. They weren't that big. They're lighter. They're lighter. And, you know, I just think there's not as much, like, fussing with the stretcher bars and things like that if you're stealing, like, an oil painting. So all three of these paintings, they were donated to the art gallery in, like, the 1930s. So these are long-held, beloved parts of their permanent art collection. Do you know who donated them? I don't. I'm sure it said it somewhere. And I was like, that's unimportant. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Except for I do know that when these paintings were eventually returned to the gallery, which we'll get to all of that later, mm-hmm. um, the family of the people who donated it were there at this like great revealing of like these paintings have been returned. So this is another story that has a happy ending of the paintings coming back. It's oh, great. great. Maybe I'll, you remember the last episode we did, we made like a huge effort to go in a linear fashion. Mm-hmm. I'm going to flip it around. I'm going to start with how the paintings were found. So we're going to start with the end. We're going to start with the end. A happy ending. We're going to start with a happy ending, and then we're just going to walk it back. Okay. Okay. So we know what paintings were gone, and there is an anonymous call that comes into the police station, and we're not... They never figured out who made the call or anything like that. But basically, the call says, hey, I know where the paintings are. They're in this old, shitty public restroom. 200 yards away from the gallery. So the police are like, uh, okay. Where in the restroom? Like, just on the floor? They don't say. Or they might say that they're in a tube because that's what they... They were in... Police go into this restroom. And this is like an abandoned concrete... You know, like one of the... It's just like a... There's graffiti everywhere. It's all boarded up. There's litter all over the place, like old soggy leaves. Like, it's just gross. It's like Hmm. a... It's like a just unused public restroom situation. Uh, And it's been raining all weekend. So it's it's damp and wet. Not good condition for art. Not... That's like the worst condition for art. And these paintings are discovered rolled up in a cardboard poster tube. So the thing that can just like get wet and dissolve. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So they go in and they find the tube and they see a little bit of one of the paintings sticking out. And they're like, oh, God, this is it. This is only two days after they went missing. So this is... They get the call at like 2 a.m. and then they go straight there. So the paintings aren't gone for very long, but they have been sitting in this crappy, soggy, concrete cave-like thing. I like the juxtaposition of soggy and concrete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes so much sense. <laughs> well, one of the one of the reports I read is funny because it talks, it like goes through the meticulous detail of like what graffiti was written on the walls. So mm-hmm. like, you know, Anonymous is like looking for sex and you know, called Diana at this number to for a good time. You know, yeah. this one report like lists all the graffiti like around the wall where this tube is leaning. Ooh, which I'd is love pretty it. Funny. Are there photographs of that? Yes. So there are photographs of this of the place. That's why like I don't know, it's the detail is really cool because when you see a photograph of this place, you're like, oh my gosh. Like to imagine these paintings just like rolled up and left in a tube. But the best part about how they were left was there was a note on the tube from the thieves. And I have a picture of this note. Okay. Because it's really great. (laughs) So it says, the the note just says, the intention was not to steal, only to highlight the woeful security. (laughs) What? For those of you who are listening, I'll put this on our Instagram so you can go like see this note. But it it looks like it was written by... This handwriting's incredible. Yeah, the handwriting is amazing. It's like damaged by the rain. So the letters are kind of like washed out. And the word not is underlined. Right. The intention so, was not to steal. But they did. Yeah. <laughs> they definitely stole it. So that was their thing is that they were trying to highlight the woeful security. Wow. And then it's crazy. It's like hole punched on both sides. Of- so that was, yeah. So that's the note that was found on the tube with the paintings. So the idea, I guess, was that these thieves just wanted to show the museum like, hey, this is really unsecure. We just did this. We don't even want your paintings. We don't even want your damn paintings. We don't even want your damn paintings. We're going to call you and let you know where they are. But, you know, (laughs) you should work on your security. It's like a combination of the scream where it's like a thousand thanks thanks for for poor security. And then also reminds me of the Kempton Button story that we talked about. The bus driver. Yeah. 
I mean, it was definitely seen like w- when the note was found, it was seen as like a protest, some sort some sort of protest. Hmm. To me, it sounds like students. Mm-hmm. This sounds like a student thing to me. It doesn't sound like an, ad- I don't know, an adult. That's what I'm picturing, too. Yeah, I'm imagining like just little punk rockers or something Mm -hmm. going and taking these. So there's no security footage of this. So I'll preface this by they, the thieves never got caught. We still don't know. We don't know who did it. I mean, we kind of get an idea of why, Mm -hmm. but I think the police just let it go. I looked everywhere to try and find if there was ever an arrest made in this case and didn't see anything about it. So I almost just feel like they let it go. Yeah, it's so odd. Yeah, I mean, they, they risk, got the pain. They risk back. going to jail just to get this message across the museum. I know. It's it's very ridiculous. Why not just tell the museum? Well, I don't know. This is a way to tell them, but... Or just give the paintings... I mean, you could do that in a way that doesn't actually harm the paintings. Yeah. That's sloppy. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very sloppy. So the paintings were pretty damaged. The paintings were not extremely damaged, but one of the Van Gogh had water damage and another one had a tear, like a tear in the corner. Oh, this gallery had security cameras, by the way. Mm. They had like CCTV cameras in the gallery, but it says that they were not on because it was the weekend and there weren't security guards to watch the monitors. Okay, but still good to have footage. Yeah, like why? That's not what it's about. Makes no sense. (laughs) Yeah. So were the paintings, they weren't hanging on the walls, or where were they located when they were stolen? So the thieves are thought to have entered by forcing open these, like, steel-covered doors in the back of the gallery. Mm -hmm. And then they turned into what is called, I don't really know the exact layout of this gallery, but it's called the Margaret Pilkington Room. Mm -hmm. And it's on the ground floor. So they just broke in. They go into this room and they grab the two nearest works of art and then a third one at the end of the wall. So they were mounted. Yeah. It says that they unscrewed them from the wall. So I don't know what that means. I'm trying to imagine like what that means. Hmm. But it says they unscrewed them from the wall and then took them. I mean, they obviously took them out of their frames, but the frames were never recovered. So I don't know when they did that. So I think they just took them frames and all off of the wall and then at some point took the paintings out of their frame, ditched the frames, and then rolled the paintings up and put them in the tube. And they never found the frames? No. Okay. Because the gallery was later asking, like, can you please give the frames back? <laughs> yeah. Frames I mean, are frames, are, fra- they're expensive. And when they're custom made to fit a particular size artwork, and they, they could have been those frames that have the little title block kind of mounted onto the Oh, right. Frame, you know. Yeah. Some of them will, like, say the artist's name or... Huh. Something like that. Did anyone have any theories, any of the like investigators on this case as to who did it? Yeah, they were thinking that it was like some sophisticated, you know, the whole idea was like, oh, this is a sophisticated art crime. Like, there, you know, someone has ordered these paintings to be stolen, all of that. But there's no evidence of that at all. And I think that that was their initial theory. But once the paintings were returned, obviously... It wasn't. It right. was just someone trying to just make a statement, I guess. Yeah. Well, so one of the staff members at the gallery said, we would not describe our security as woeful. <laughs> I think they took a real offense <laughs> to this word. <laughs> like, of all the things to call their security, woeful just wasn't a word that they liked. Mm-hmm. And she said, you know, the system was updated two years ago, and it was sophisticated, but thieves could have gotten around even sophisticated systems. So they were trying to justify it saying no but really there nothing was on the alarm systems weren't on like the cameras weren't on i mean that's pretty woeful i would say that's very like they proved their like if this is a statement they're making they proved it to be true yeah so i mean the thieves they managed to bypass the alarm system or disable it if it was actually on unscrew the paintings carry them back out the back door that they pried open and then they left through a hole in the chain link fence Mm. And scampered away or whatever. Scampered. Do. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine I think them having these definitely little... <laughs> scamper. <laughs> yeah, so no one even knew that they were gone mm. until, you know, the guards came back on that Monday. So the guards were the first to discover the, the absence of painting. Yeah, and then there was a 2 a.m. phone call that Monday to the police like station. Yeah. So once the media started reporting on this theft before, you know, well, I guess this was this was all after the fact. So the media didn't even really get to it before they had actually already found the paintings. But they all started calling the bathroom where the paintings were found the mm-hmm. Louvre, like L O. Oh, because they say the Louvre. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. So I thought that was pretty funny. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so this this like very, I don't know, just nondescript old bathroom mm-hmm. now has this 
cult little I if I were go to Manchester I would love to just stop by and see that bathroom yeah go to the Louvre yeah <laughs> <laughs> write something on the wall like Thick as Thieves was here yeah uh, we need to master how Saskia draws the picture of us oh yeah that's true and that can be our tag yes but then she would maybe get in trouble yeah. for our graffiti. So we need to, I don't know, whatever. We'll figure it well, out. Well, she's not going to get in trouble. They're not yeah, going to go who's find gonna her. Go, who's going to be like, did you do graffiti in this like disgusting bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not. Something that's interesting to me, though, that this museum did in the meantime. So when they found out that the works were gone in the what seems to be like a kind of small space before they were back on the wall, or maybe it took a little longer to restore these paintings, was that they replaced, you know, they immediately replaced the works with other artworks. Mm-hmm. So they didn't do the whole thing where it's like leaving the space open to as like some kind of memorial statement to the fact that these were gone. So they opened back up, put some other artwork on the wall and just kind of like moved along. But what's interesting is when they got the tube back, Mm-hmm. Before, like, they had to very, very carefully and meticulously, like, get these artworks out of the tube because it was soggy, it was rainy, and so there was probably a whole lot of pressure on the conservationist. What was her name? Nicola Walker is her name. Nicola Walker. Nicola Walker. I just like that sound better. Nicola. Nicola? Nicola. (laughs) But it sounds like Coca Cola. Oh. Nicola. I don't know. I mean, that's, yeah, I guess that sounds better. Maybe it is. What, how did you say it the first time? Nicola. Oh, did you? Mm, okay. <laughs> that works. <laughs> if you are Nicola Walker and you want to tell us how you say your name, feel free to call in. Right. And let us know. <laughs> so she was the conservationist who, that's a pretty big job. I would say if you're their like conservation expert, doing that is a pretty high stakes, high pressure job. So she was the one who dealt with the getting all the paintings out of the soggy tube. Wow. Yeah. When they got them out, they didn't put them back up in the galleries? They did. They did. They eventually did. And then they had this, they had a big party that was like, hey, we, we've got these back. They're back in their frames. They've been conserved. So all is, all is well. And so the director of the gallery, who is Alistair Smith, Alistair, Alistair, said, he, this is, was his big quote on the thievery. He says, as a public art gallery, we are committed to ensuring that our wonderful collection of art and design is on display for as many people as possible to view and enjoy. I am therefore delighted that these precious works have been recovered in good condition and have been remounted and reframed for public exhibition. That was his statement, Mm -hmm. which I think is a little lackluster, but boring, boring. I think they, I don't know. It's a university gallery. Sometimes they're... I bet that one's fancy. They reopened. They, I was, like, reading stories where they had a whole... Like, they redid the building and reopened in 2015 or something. Okay. Um, so this might have been when they were still somewhat... I think Manchester's a kind of fancy city. Oh, is it? It's, like, the second largest city in England. Once known as Cottonopolis. Cottonopolis? Like, the nickname of Cottonopolis. <laughs> what, it, it was what does the, that mean? It's the birth of the Industrial Revolution kind of happened there and another weird thing i know about manchester is that the first ever assembled computer happened there oh yeah that seems like a hard thing to pinpoint i don't know i guess it's the first one that was like wow boop, 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 boop. it was when it was like a room <laughs> is, that the, is that the sound of the original computer yeah boop, 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 boop. it was probably even louder than that <laughs> they probably hadn't developed like the cute sounds for computers yet yeah <laughs> wow i didn't know that mm-hmm that's pretty cool. It's like a city of a lot of firsts. You know, I think like the first train station or something in hmm. in Europe was there. Maybe. Don't quote me on that one. I'm, I'm very <laughs> sure about the Cottonopolis thing and everything else I said, but the train station one, there's some train history relevance to Manchester. But anyway, it's also like home of like the famous soccer team and... Hmm. Manchester United, I think, mm-hmm. and some other stuff. This is supposed to be, yeah, it's it's definitely a really important gallery there. I'm trying to think of what museum is there. There's I'm a sure good one. That, yeah. Well, I mean, two. I mean, those are those are pretty amazing works. Yeah. That they, they've had since 1930. So this, Right. So that's early days to be getting works of art like that. You know, yeah. 1930, people were still on the fence about a lot of the weird artwork that existed. America was definitely like way behind it was they very were... behind in the development and embracing of it all but still mm-hmm. it's, it's, I'm, I'm curious about who the collector was that donated it i don't know but that not that i want to rub that in or anything yeah i mean but no it's amazing that people are you know that someone was on the kind of edge of that collecting 
those works and thinking to donate it to a gallery and all that. Like, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's interesting. I think all of that plays into the history of how artworks get famous in the first place, you know. Right, because of these artists, we're not going to talk about Picasso, but, you know, Picasso did well during his lifetime. He did really well. Like, people accepted him and celebrated him, paid for his work, mm-hmm. and he was a wealthy, successful, fancy, celebrated artist. But Van Gogh or Van Gogh, he only sold one work of art in his lifetime. And he was very upset about And he that. was not a happy man. No. I've heard that the happiest year of his life was in England, though. Oh. There was, like, a moment of happiness, and he was, like, in love with somebody, and he had a job that was kind of cool that he lost, and, yeah, so his brightest time was in England, Hmm. arguably, I guess. And then Gauguin, I can't stop thinking about this, um, you know the podcast Benjamin Walker's Theory of Everything? Mm -hmm. He does this whole episode on Gauguin, or maybe it's not on Gauguin, it's on, like, a, a theme of, like, failure, but... He has this very expressive storytelling style when he talks about Gauguin's like first big art exhibition in Paris, Mm -hmm. um, which ended up being a total crash and burn situation. Like everyone was making fun of him. Oh, no. It was like a very humiliating experience. That's so sad. Yeah. It's worth. Well, he came back. He, you know. I mean, he he came back from that. Yeah, I don't really know that much about him. I've always been, I've never embraced him. I'm not crazy about a lot of his paintings. And then he went on the whole uh, Tahitian kind of bender. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He just started, he fell in love with Tahiti and Tahitian women and just had, went there and started making all sorts of paintings there. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how successful he was in his lifetime. Yeah. Because it just seems like most artists just kind of die penniless Mm. back then. And then they get extremely famous. Afterwards, after the fact. Yeah. Right. Okay, so Gauguin spent, or he spent 10 years of his life in French Polynesia. And to me, that's like what I think of when I think of him. I think of those paintings. Oh, yeah. From that time period. And everything else is just kind of like, I don't know, impressionist stuff that's like kind of run of the mill. Oh, so do we want to talk about who's doing the drawings for the last two? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Sarah and I decided that even though we're not visual artists, or I definitely don't identify as one. I mean, just I'm not, I don't make visual work. Yeah, um, I don't. I went to art school, but I quit, <laughs> I quit, basically quit making art and like just went straight to writing Yeah, right after I graduated. So yeah, I just like working with visual art, but I'm not a visual artist. I think people keep thinking I'm one um, because I do this Art Heist podcast. And mm-hmm. the other day someone's like, you've never shown me your paintings before. And I was like... <laughs> I don't they don't have exist. any. <laughs> but for the sake of this little the artwork aspect of this podcast where we ask people to do their version of a stolen artwork that we're talking about, we decided for the last two that we'll both We're going to do it. Do it. I'm going to try to draw right something. <laughs> yeah, so Veronica is doing the artwork for this episode. This episode. And, I don't know, and you're doing I, the scream. Yeah, I will have already done <laughs> yeah, the, the timeline is so weird when recording these <laughs> we'll do in the future <laughs> when you're listening to this in the present we will have both done our drawings and they will be up for the world to and see and we're excited about it we are it's, yeah that'll be that'll be fun mm-hmm. i'm more excited just to see how my brain will feel when i'm drawing or making art you know i imagine it feels quite different than writing mm-hmm. i have a journal and i i do a lot of like little i wouldn't say like masterpieces but i i do drawing stuff i do I, little it's scribbles. not super yeah it's not super foreign to me or a paint or something like that but yeah. i definitely don't do it in a i i think i just met so many awesome artists in art school that i was just like you know what i'm a writer i'm not this like it became very obvious to me what thing was a lot more gratifying and just felt better writing just felt better all around and it Mm -hmm. made you know I was already halfway into a like painting program and so there was really no I didn't want to just like try and restructure my whole like college thing so I just kept Mm -hmm. going with the painting and you know graduated but basically right when I got out of school I just did writing yeah but painting's still fun but you know what you just painting you have to have a whole operation and so yeah you, ha- you know it's it's a lot of space it costs a lot you have to store all your artwork you have to sell it later you know it's like it just it was for me I respect anyone who's able to do that so much because for me it was very overwhelming yeah and I loved writing because it was like it costs nothing it takes up zero space you know like I can do it absolutely anywhere mm-hmm. and it just felt a lot freer 
yeah. to me. When I painted as a kid, I was the worst at washing my paintbrushes afterwards. Mm-hmm. Like I just wanted to leave the paint disaster <laughs> with the brush stuck in the paint and walk away from it. And it would be like two days later, my mom would be like, how long has this been sitting out? You know, mm-hmm. and then it was just stuck and everything was ruined. <laughs> so basically, I was didn't work for me for right, that reason. Because yeah. you have to spend as much time, maybe not as much time, but you have to spend a significant amount of time cleaning up afterwards. Oh, yeah. And it's even worse with printmaking. Yeah. Printmakers, like I did, I took a lot of printmaking classes in college, and that is a whole. I mean, you spend probably ten percent of your time as a printmaker actually in the creative process of you know coming up with a design or something, and then the ninety percent of the rest of the time is like actually executing this plan or this mm-hmm. design. You know, so whether it's like cutting a wood block or doing like screen printing and making all the screens, and then like all the ink that has to happen and all the cleanup, and it's just a whole process. I respect the hell out of printmakers because it is yeah. very involved. Yeah. I very think all tedious. the forms are very involved. And I, oh, well, yeah. I like, not that I'm trying to do a thing where I'm like, all of them are equal, <laughs> I, you know, but they're just all too involved for me to do them myself. Except right. with the exception of like, I used to love filming things, but that's not oh, even, yeah, that's right. That's not even really that hard. Like, it's all like on a little machine in a tiny machine. You're just... But oh, ask the filmmakers that, Veronica. I'm <laughs> sure that <laughs> it's not really that hard. It's just all on a tiny machine. <laughs> well, in terms of cleanup, there is really not much. And editing is really fun. And mm-hmm. I don't know, capturing footage and then like looking at it. I like the old days when you had little tapes and then you like you could play those tapes on it, you know, but mm-hmm. you didn't really look at it while you were filming. You would just see it after the filming. You could make a video. You could make a tiny little video as you're. Whoa. interpretation of video art interpretation <laughs> of I think I'm going to go with the Van Gogh mm-hmm. hmm I'll try it out and see what happens uh, that could be cool that it could be pretty cool could be cool we'll figure it out yeah okay so I guess that's a wrap for season one yeah of thanks for listening especially if you've listened to all of them oh my thanks goodness for subscribing yeah thanks for everything like it's <laughs> Thanks to our friends who gave it, like, sent us lots of different little headlines and feedback and all the fun conversations that we've had about our voices sounding the same yeah. and <laughs> um, people who have shared just, yeah, any kind of feedback that you've had. We've had a lot of really wonderful chats with friends yeah. around the, the creation of this podcast. It's been very fun. Yeah, I'm glad that we did it. And there will be more to come. Season two is going to happen and um, it will have a bit of a variation that we have yet to determine. Mm-hmm. But we've been talking about interviewing people. I'm Yes especially excited to like interview a security guard yes yes um, you may have noticed that we have not even touched the Gardner Museum heist and that is because there's an entire podcast already devoted just to that heist called Last Scene which is terrific mm-hmm. and I just kind of feel like a lot of people have talked about that heist it's amazing and interesting and all that but I, it's like the elephant in the room, though. We never really talk about it. Okay. Maybe it's not an elephant in the room. Yeah, I think we I think we explained that we weren't going to talk about that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Memor- <laughs> memory's tricky in the hot summer heat. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we're, we've got some things up our sleeve for season two that will be Things very... up our sleeve that are not artworks. <laughs> <laughs> or golden eggs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This podcast is brought to you by We Own This Town, which is a Nashville-based podcast family. And Saskia Colgess does our artwork, like our show artwork, and it's I'm in love with it. Our theme song is by Patrick Dampier. Yeah. And that's it. That's it. Talk to you in the fall. Bye. Bye. <laughs>so we were hanging out with a friend of hers was in town from Minneapolis and he's a like professor in what ethnomusicology musicology anyways he has a PhD literally he studies voices he studies like all of the ranges of what like all of it he just breaks the voice down in all of his like research and and at our house or at my (laughs) my house at a party that we had um he was in another room. He's known Veronica for forever. He was in another room, and I was telling a story in another room, and he thought it was her telling that story. And this is a man who is so educated. Expert on voices. Expert on voices. Yeah. And he came in there because he. it was like a story that I was telling, and he was just like, she's never told me that, you know? And It was like a car wreck story. So he like jumped up thinking like, oh, my God, Veronica never told me about this traumatizing car accident. <laughs> and then he came in and noticed it was you. Yeah. So... <laughs> Apparently we just we we sound a lot alike sometimes. Yep. yep.